Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to today's uh, dream seminar. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome um, our speaker, Ankur Thali, uh, who's at uh, Google Brain. Um, Ankur, Ankur uh, got his PhD from Stanford uh, about seven years ago. Um, and he's, he's actually worked over a really broad range of topics, but they all come together very nicely in this challenge of uh, bringing high assurance to machine learning based systems. Uh, so Ankur has worked in uh, formal methods, in programming languages, in computer security, and now most recently in machine learning and AI. And uh, he's done a number of very interesting things, including verification of hybrid systems, program synthesis, and language-based security. Uh, but today he's going to tell us about the, the recent work that he's been doing on uh, analyzing and designing neural networks. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Sanjit, for having me. Uh, it's been a great day. I've really enjoyed the conversations today. So, uh, you know, as Sanjit mentioned, my my background is mostly the core background is in formal methods. So that's where the training is. Uh, and then, uh, last only the last two or three years, I've been uh, I've been doing deep learning research, and that too from an analytical point of view. So not training models, but analyzing them. So please correct me if I misrepresent anything from deep learning. Uh, or I'd be too negative on the field. Uh, okay, so so this is the quintessential deep learning slide. So deep neural networks are are everywhere. They've achieved remarkable performance on a variety of tasks, uh, you know, from object recognition to translating, uh, machine translation, medical diagnosis, game playing, and so on. Uh, so what are deep networks? They are um, a really expressive model for representing a variety of nonlinear functions. Uh, they're described using this network of neurons. So each neuron apply, so these neurons are organized in, in layers. And each layer applies a nonlinear transformation to the input, which is then fed to the neurons in the next layer, next layer, and so on, and you get a prediction. Now, while they achieve uh, really good accuracy on a variety of tasks, a trained network is still a black box to humans. So as a, as a, as a model developer or a, or a user, it's still unclear to me how does this model reason? Uh, what is the basis of these predictions? So in particular, we are interested in this question of, you know, why did the network make a certain prediction? So here's an image of a fireboat. And there, the top label from an object recognition network is fireboat. Now I'm interested in, okay, why is this a fireboat? You know, is it the sky? Is it the bridge? Is it the water? Is it these water spouts? What what makes this image a fireboat? This is a little bit more interesting example. This image is labeled a clog. Uh, that's what a clog is. Uh, so now again, you know, why is this a clog? Uh, what? Why did the network call it a clog? You can ask the same question for text models. You know, here's a piece of text that's labeled positive sentiment. Okay, which words make it positive sentiment? What happens if I change those words? So with that motivation, we formulated this question as the attribution problem. So what we'd like to do is, given an input and a prediction, we want to attribute this prediction to features of the input, which means we want to assign a certain score to every feature, which is in proportion to the feature's contribution to that prediction. So in an object detection network, we'd like to know which pixels contributed the most to this prediction, to that fireboat prediction. Or in a text network, it's which words were the most relevant. Uh, now this is a very reductive formulation of why this prediction. You know, why this prediction is like a very broad question. And uh, there are a few different approaches that have come up to tackle that question. So I can tell you about the other approaches. So one formulation of this is um, I want a local approximation of this network. So I want to approximate the behavior of this network locally using a simpler model, like a decision tree. That's very understandable. There are works that try to come up with a global approximation of the network using a simple model. Then there are works that try to reason about the prediction at an input based on which training instances contributed to it. So, you know, the network is behaving a certain way because it saw these other images or these other inputs during training, which is what is, has dictated this logic. We're doing none of that. 
we are doing attribution. Simple problem. Single input, trained model, you have a prediction, you want to know which features were responsible for this prediction. If this is a linear model, this is obvious, this is the first thing you would do. This is examining the feature weights. It roughly amounts to that. So once you have attributions, what all can you do? So one is you could debug network predictions. So if you find uh, a misclassified input, for example, then you could run attributions on it and see, okay, which pixels caused the misclassification? You could generate explanations for the end user. So think of a medical diagnosis network. So it, it's taking images of chest x-rays and it's saying it has cancer or not. And that's a very black box prediction that these models produce. If I have attribution, I could take the prediction back to the pixels and say, okay, it was these pixels. Hopefully the pixels capture lesions or something of interest to, to, to the radiologist. Then you could reason about uh, network robustness. So if I look at attributions, then I can find, okay, what are the most frequently attributed features? Do they indicate some sort of bias in this model? You know, is it that it's, if, if this feature is present, then the model always has this prediction, but this is not what we want. And the last one is prediction confidence, which falls out from this robustness analysis. Can I observe these attributions and then make a, then make a decision on whether to trust the network's prediction or not? You know, if it takes these features into account, then it makes sense. But if it's taking those features into account, then I don't believe the prediction so much. By the way, please feel free to interrupt me with questions at any point. Uh, ah, so key point over here. We want to attribute a prediction for a given input relative to a baseline. Our explanations are relative to a baseline input. So what we are doing is like a diff. You have this input, and then I have a baseline, which is an information-less input, like a neutral input. I want to know relative to this neutral input, what was the most important feature in this input. Now, there is some very old theory in, in um, in psychology, by, there's this famous paper by Kahneman and Miller on uh, the importance of baselines. You know, anytime us humans are explaining something, there is always an implicit baseline. So he has this very good example, you know, a man suffers from indigestion. Now, the doctor blames it on a stomach ulcer because the doctor's baseline is that people who don't have the stomach ulcer don't complain. The man's wife bl blames it on eating turnips because she says that the days he doesn't eat turnips, he doesn't complain of, of indigestion. So both these explanations are valid, except that they are, they are relative to different baselines. So this baseline will play an important part in our, in our attribution technique. And it's also a good analysis knob. You know, depending on what baseline you choose, you can get a different explanation out. So mathematically, what we are explaining is this. We are explaining this diff. Oh, so, so suppose f of baseline is zero. So if I'm assuming some, some sort of, let's say it's uh, some prediction from minus one to one and zero is the neutral point, then this amounts to just explaining f of input. So you don't want to diff with respect, so by, by default, you want to diff with something, something completely empty, and then you bring in the features of the input at hand. So take a black image, and then I slowly make the image appear. So black image is like the original image with zero brightness. Let me dial up the brightness slowly. Now I want to know what's important. All right, so the plan is I'll tell you about a method that we developed uh, a couple of years back called Integrated Gradients. It was published at ICML 2017. And then I'll go over those applications that I talked about. So since then, we've applied it uh, to various different tasks. I'll then move to some caveats and limitations. And then if we have time, I'll talk about a different way of tackling this why this prediction problem, which is using preconditions. OK, so now you want to do attributions. What's a naive approach? So naive approaches are ablations. You drop the feature, see what the change in the pred prediction is, and that's the contribution of that feature. Now, the problem with this is, well, A, it's computationally expensive if you have too many features, like in image models. Uh, B, if you drop a feature, then it may produce an unrealistic 
input, an input that the network has never seen before. So although it may drop the prediction or it may change the prediction drastically, that doesn't mean that, that the, the, the blame for it falls on that feature alone. A third reason is that if you have features interacting, so if it's that both A and B have to be present, or either A or B have to be present for this prediction, then if dropping either of them won't have an impact. What does it mean to drop a feature? You change it to its zero value, so assuming. You're saying, assuming there's a default value for every feature, then you... Yeah, yeah, you, you could, so there are many different, different definitions of dropping. So there's, if, if there is a zero value, you set it to that. Um, or you set it to some training distribution mean, or you set it to noise. But it's like a drastic perturbation to remove that signal. The other approach is this one, feature times gradient. So this is what you would do in a linear model. So in a linear model, this is called, I think, in statistics, it's called benefit. So you take, you take the coefficient, and you take the feature. That's the contribution of that feature. In fact, uh, more precisely, it's the value of the feature at input minus the value of the feature at baseline times the coefficient. That's what how much that feature is going to be. This is very intuitive. So why not we try this? So what does this mean for a nonlinear model? For a nonlinear model, this means looking at the first order Taylor approximation. So it says, let's take the first derivative of the output with respect to the inputs and do this. So it's like, it's taking the first order Taylor approximation which makes it a linear model and then let's look at benefit. Okay, so let's do that for the fireboat image. So the picture on the right is a visualization of feature times gradient. So each pixel of the original image is scaled by that value, by its attribution. So the, the brightest pixels are the ones that have the most attribution. Now if you notice, the attribution is kind of scattered all over the place. It looks like, you know, it's, it's these water spouts over here, there's some stuff over here that's important. Yeah? What is why? Why is the prediction? What is, what are you predicting? Oh, so it's a classification task across labels. Why is the logit score for the class that was predicted, for the highest scoring class? Or you could also take the probability if you take it post softmax or something. So these gradients seem like noisy. This isn't very informative. At least this is not how we humans would think that a fireboat is recognized. Now maybe the network is using some crazy logic to recognize a fireboat. Or maybe this is maybe the, the attribution technique is is not functioning well. So, yeah. Please. So, this reminds me of the fact that, or, you know, there's a lot of results on adversarial examples where they, I think the way adversarial examples work is they take those portions of the gradients that make no sense to us and exploit them. But there are also um, work around, or there are methods that try to eliminate the adversarial examples. I wonder if after applying one of those methods, that whether that scan would look a lot more sensible to a human gradient method might then work better. So, so it, you're right. So it could be that this image, so if this is an adversarial images exploit this property of neural networks that the gradient of a bunch of pixels all over the place together can switch the class. Like if you, if you sprinkle, if you increase it by a little bit. So if this image were adversarial, then that could happen. Or it could be that these gradients aren't that informative. It turns out that for this, this particular image, it's the latter. And the reason I say that is this. So we want to explain the prediction at this input relative to this baseline. So you have this function that you're trying to explain, except gradients are a very pointwise, it's the pointwise derivative of that function. So it's very, very local behavior. If you want to really understand this function, let's just take all points between the baseline and the input. Now, of course, this is a high dimensional space, there's several, several points. So let's scale. Let's, let's take this straight line path from the baseline to the input. Let's take points along this path and let's observe the prediction. The prediction has this kind of a plot. So notice what's happening. For this entire region, the prediction is flat, which means the gradients are tiny. 
So looking at the gradients won't be informative because the network has already made its mind. Minor perturbations aren't going to change its prediction. On the other hand, early on, early on there's a huge jump. So these are the interesting gradients. As I'm bringing in features slowly, there's a jump in the prediction. So this gives us our method. So our method is, let's take the straight line path from the baseline to the image and integrate the gradient along this path. So it's the line integral of the gradient. Uh, yes, uh, though what, what do you have in mind? So it matters for a certain axiom that we want to hold, make sure that it holds, yeah. I'll get to that. But it any that's true, yes, yes. And it makes a difference? It makes a difference to one particular axiom. So I, I'll just get to that in a, in a couple, hold that thought please, yeah, it's just a few sides. Why does straight line matter? You can take a curved path also from the baseline to the input and take the line integral. Now one nice property of that line integral, just by basic calculus, is that it's equal to f of input minus f of baseline. Right? So, so this, is the, this is the main side of the method. So, so let me say it again. What you do is, you take the partial derivative of the output with respect to every pixel, and you integrate the partial derivative along this path. Call that the attribution to that pixel. <coughs> now when you do that and you scale, you get a picture like that one. This makes a lot more sense. It, it's recognizing key features of the final board. So it, it seems plausible that the network behaves this way. Here are a few other images comparing integrated gradients to just gradients. Correct. Um, is there any difference the baseline? Yes. Uh, there is. So, 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 uh, turns out for ImageNet, black is a decent baseline. For MNIST, black is a good baseline. Now, but instead, consider the MNIST task where it's flipped. The digit appears in black, the background is in white. Then black is a terrible baseline. Because then nothing will fall on the on the digit because there's no diff. There you want to use white as your baseline. That's why I said it's a, it's a little bit of a, I don't have a good answer to what's a good baseline. Uh, it depends a bit on the task. It's sort of the neutral point. And humans do that all the time. Like we always have an implicit baseline, please. You can find many neutral points where the network says I'm neutral. Yes. Uh, so, so it depends, so that is one criterion that the baseline should have a neutral prediction. Secondly, and this is very vague, so I apologize for that, it shouldn't have artifacts. So in the sense that there shouldn't be any meaningful features in there. Because then the diff or the path would first involve cancelling those features and then bringing in the new features. So, and that will corrupt your attribution. So white noise is another baseline that we have played with, but this one, I mean, um, all of these are reasonable baselines. For different tasks, different baselines make sense. In one particular case, uh, so we applied this to a binary classification. So there was an image classification network trying to predict two labels. So it was on retinal images, and I think it was predicting whether you have a certain uh, property or not. I forget what it was. Now there, all images, like the black image was overwhelmingly one property. So that's not a good baseline because it's already predicted to be, you know, of class one. So what we ended up doing there is we introduced a third class called neutral. We threw in black images into the training set, labeled them as neutral and retrained the network to force a neutral point. Now you have something to compare against. Ah, now how do you evaluate an attribution method? Uh, 
So there are many, many different methods, by the way, to solve this attribution problem. So ours is based on gradients. There are other methods that try to trickle down the score. So there is the network is like a net is like a ne you have a network of neurons, right? So you can trickle down the score by reversing each nonlinearity and distributing the score down. The problem with all of these methods, including ours, is how do we justify them? Like what constitutes a good attribution? Now, one approach is you say, okay, if you say these features are the most important, then let me drop or ablate these features. Then the prediction should go away. The problem there is again you would introduce artifacts. So suppose you know you found that the water spouts are important, so I ablated it by putting that giant square. But now I have an artifactual image. If the prediction goes away, I don't know if it's because of the square. The second approach that I've also seen is uh, you collect ground truth for why it should be the fireboat. So you will have, you, you ask humans in all of these images to label the fireboat or label the clog. You know, what are the pixels? Just draw the outline. And then you try to compare attributions to what was labeled. So this is pretty reasonable. Except it, it has this risk of confirmation bias. So the network could be reasoning completely differently from the human. So if we expect it to match this guy's ground truth, then that, that's too strong a requirement. Like it could be that the network doesn't match, but is doing the right, that is still the right explanation. And then see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can construct toy tasks, which we have done. So you, you, the task that we've done is, you have images of a square, and then circles. Okay, the square was a circle, and you wanted to fall on the periphery, uh, or, or the, the corners. That really tells it that it's a square. So that one works out fine, but to do this, so this one, you know, the, the application I'm talking about is so there are all these medical diagnosis networks. Uh, they built at Google, uh, diagnosed test x-rays. There, there was this effort on, okay, let's just also collect annotations from the radiologist, saying this is, a this is lung cancer and this is the lesion. Now train a network to predict lung cancer, do attributions, and then see if it shows the lesions or not. Now, I think forcing, like, requiring the attributions to show what the radiologist thinks is important is, I think, too strong. The network may have picked up a whole different signal that the radiologist isn't aware of, right? And so, so if you force that, then there is this risk of confirmation bias. So the mandate for attributions is to be faithful to what the network is doing. We have a different way of justifying it, which is, which is debatable too. Uh, so our approach is we list certain axioms that an attribution method ought to satisfy. And then we show that integrated gradients is the unique method satisfying those axioms. So here are the axioms, there are six axioms. So the first one is insensitivity. If a feature is irrelevant to the prediction, so if f of x1 through xn, if there is an xi that, is that f is independent of, then it should get no attribution. Sensitivity, if all else equal, if I change this feature and the prediction changes, it should get some attribution. Linearity preservation, if my network is expressed as a linear combination of two other networks, then attributing through this combined network should be same as attributing through the individual network. So attributing through, yes. Yes, 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 yeah. You can think of it as a multivariate function, yeah. So there's linearity preservation. There's implementation invariance. Two networks that compute the same function for all inputs should have identical attribution. This is where the trickling down methods suffer. So all these methods that try to trickle down the score and then come up with an attribution, they're highly sensitive to the topology of the network. You can have two networks that implement the exact same function, but will end up with different attributions because the bracketing of the, the, the computation is different. Then there's completeness, which is some of the attributions should be f of input minus f of baseline. 
that gives me the, the line is symmetry. That gives me a path. Any path integral has, a, has completeness. Symmetry is if the network is symmetric in two variables and they have the same value at the input, they should have identical attribution. So the moment you bend a path along any dimension, it kind of favors that one. It will compute its derivatives before the other ones. At the extreme, you can follow the periphery of this hypercube. Let me bring in this feature, then I'll bring in that feature, then I'll bring in that feature, and then to the top. Instead, we are moving along the diagonal. With those six axioms, you can prove that uh, this is the unique method. So actually, this, is, this method is not our invention. Uh, so my co-authors on this paper were uh, had a background in game theory. Co so in cooperative game theory, uh, there is this problem of if you have uh, if you have a cooperative game and they create a certain value, how do you apportion bonuses? If you have a company and there are lots of employees, they're creating certain value. How much bonus should you? Get? So there, there is this. The, the famous method is called Shapley value. And there's the omen shapley method. These are both attribution methods that are justified axiomatically. So these axioms are a restatement of the omen shapley axioms. Right. Uh, on linearity uh, causation, yeah. so are we assuming that like, the way that people read as well also has this linearity of attribution? Or like, it seems to me that like, certain things you may have. <coughs> Why do we sort of force the no, no. So the linearity is a different axiom. So all it's saying is, if your network has a top-level linear combination, mm -hmm. then the attribution should distribute in the same way as that linear combination. So from this attribution can still be through a non-linear network. Mm -hmm. It's just that if the top level is linear, then it should just distribute. Okay. The reason is, if you don't have this one, then you'll get weird results on a linear model. So that is another way people try to sanity check these techniques. You know, how do they perform on a linear model? Because there we understand everything. So this method has gotten uh, quite a bit popular at Google, not because of the axiomatic guarantee. So that is just to get the paper accepted. The, uh, the, the, the real reason to use the method is very easy to implement. So in one hour, you can implement it on, on any of your deep learning frameworks. So if you have a deep model, I highly recommend trying it. Because uh, even if there's, you know, even if in, on, on some inputs you learn something new about your network, that should be useful. So given that people don't analyze networks at all, using a simple method to get some insights quickly is, is useful. And it doesn't require modifying the network, just requires gradient calls. So it's very, very simple. Okay, so let's go to the first application, uh, debugging network behavior. Okay, this is that clog image. That's the attribution. You can sort of see a clog appearing. So what is the color? Oh, uh, yeah, so the visualization, which is critical in, in exam, like the visualization is very important to how you interpret the attribution. In this case was done by scaling the pixels in proportion to the attribution. So you take this image, and then you have a multiplier for every pixel, which is the attribution. So you have a 0 to 1 multiplier. So we normalize the attributions to be between 0 and 1. Now you can see all the pixels around that red. You know, it's sort of creating, if you sort of squint at it, you can sort of see a clog. Here's a more interesting one. So. Uh, there's this team that is trying to train models to detect whether a molecule binds to a certain protein. So they had, they, you have these organic chemistry molecules, and they have a featureization of it in terms of atom features and bond features. So they're saying there are these hydrogens and carbons, and then between atom 3 and 7, there is a bond, between 4 and 9, there is a double bond, and so on. Instead of these atom features, bond features, then they'll get convolved, they get mixed up in another layer of convolution, then a, you get an encoding, a feed-forward network on top of it, and then a prediction. So we applied attributions. 
it turned out that these five carbons got identical attributions, which was sort of a bit bizarre because these five carbons have a different connectivity structure. Like, I mean, this this carbon is bonded to another carbon with a single bond, but this one is bonded to an oxygen. So why would they get identical attributions? Now it turned out this was a model bug. So there was a bug in the architecture or in the code where the bond convolutions didn't make it up. So there was a discontinuity in the network where the bond convolutions never contributed to the to the final feature vector. So you were only attributing through the atom features. So all atoms with the same atomic number got the same attribution. So this was a good thing that came out of applying attributions, at least they could see this bug. By the way, that model had, despite this bug, it had very good uh, held out AUC. Attribution, from the attribution. Yeah. After they fixed the bug, did the predictions get better or worse? Well, the predictions were already great. So, right. so the model had good, good performance despite the bug. Oh, because there was, because we saw this that atoms with the same atomic number are getting the same attribution. So which means that the bonds don't matter, but bonds are not mattering, but the bonds have been featureized. So then they just traced through the code. You know, why isn't this bond affecting this? There's, there's no edge. Yeah. Oh, this case is actually a little bit easy. So. Uh, what they did is, so you have these atom vectors, right? Now, different molecules have different number of atoms. It turns out to train these networks, it's good to have fixed length inputs. So they had a concept of a pad. So if you had only three atoms, then the rest would be pad, pad, pad. So that's a good baseline for us. Everything is pad. Because the task sort of had this neutral point. Here's another one, uh, chest x-ray, uh, they're predicting, I think they're predicting cancer. Uh, I don't know if you can see, this is integrated gradients for the top label, which is, I think, cancer. It's pointing this area over here. So we were excited, we, we showed this image to a radiologist. And, you know, what, what do you think is being pointed out here? Is, what, is this a recognizable feature? So the radiologist zoomed in and he said that, look, Actually, there are a couple of pen marks over here. So what the network is actually pointing out is the pen marks. So it turned out that the training set was real chest x-rays. And then the ones that had cancer also had annotations from the radiologist. <laughs> drawing lines. And they trained it on these images and it turned out that the network picked up on the annotation, which is a great signal. So we don't, we don't blame the network for it, but but this is another bug we sort of caught through attributions. So another project we did is uh, generating explanations for this uh, diabetic retinopathy uh, network. So diabetic retinopathy is a complication of the eye uh, that happens in advanced diabetes. If left untreated, it can lead to blindness. Uh, so there's a scheme for grading DR from retinal fundus images. So this is an image of the retina, and then there are five different grades. No DR, mild, moderate, severe, proliferative. Uh, proliferative is, is uh, vision threatening. Uh, so now you have this model that can do better than the state of the art in detecting DR, but it has no explanation. So the doctors want an explanation. You know, how, why is it saying this is proliferative DR? So again, you can apply attribution. In this case, it shows meaningful stuff. So here, so I'm not an expert, but after talking to retinal specialists, they said that it's showing neovascularization, which is these tiny blood vessels. Uh, so that's what is being pointed out. And that's actually a signal for proliferative DR, if you have uh, tiny blood vessels in the optic disc. Now, this is something, if you, if you look at the original image, it wouldn't catch your attention immediately. So, but once you look at the attributions, then you can focus on these features. So it's a good, this told us this is a good assistive tool. So in, in real deployments, you can deploy this prediction model, plus you can show 
an explanation to the doctor, saying it said this because of that. And so the hope was that it should help the doctor. <coughs> now, one key point that we realized is, although intuitively it feels that explanation should always help because it's strictly more information that we are giving, there are also cases where explanations hurt. So the two cases are if your model is by and large correct, then probably there's the risk of swaying it in the swaying the human in the other direction. Where if you have a crappy explanation, then that may throw the human off and there's less uptake for the explanation, for the model's prediction. On the other hand, there is this case of that that if the model is wrong, but the explanation is convincing. So if left on their own, the doctor would have done the right thing, but now we are showing the explanation and the prediction, so he just goes with it. There's this paper, the famous paper on humans and automation, use, misuse, disuse, and abuse. Uh, the whole space is automation bias. So to, to sort of study this, we did a study, a clinical study, with nine doctors, 2,000 images, and three experimental arms. In one case, the doctor only sees the image and grades. Other case, you see the image and the prediction. Third case, you see image, prediction, and an explanation. And then we wanted to measure lift in the doctor's accuracy, how confident the doctor is. The well, findings were interesting. So C, B was strongly better than A. So seeing the model's prediction did improve the doctor. C to B, there was not much of a lift. So there are as many cases where the explanation helped, and then there were cases where the explanation hurt. And then the other interesting piece was that both B and C increase doctor model agreement. So if you look at the predictions on experimental arm A, and then you study its agreement with what the model said. So the doctor said something, here's what the model said, there's some agreement. And then in experimental arms B and C, you can again do that. When, you, when, when the doctor sees the model's prediction, there's a strong likelihood that they agree with the model. So there's risk of over-reliance. And this varies by seniority of the doctor. So the more senior the, senior the doctor, the less agreement with the model. Yeah. So uh, was there an increase in C over B? Yes, On some images, but there were also images where the doctor was correct in B, but then was wrong in C. Mm -hmm. But less so. Overall, B was better. The overall accuracy was better at B. There were individual images where the grade was correct in experimental arm A than in B. But if you take the overall accuracy, it was better in B. Yeah. No. Uh, so the sequential thing is they are planning it now to do that study. This was done as three separate arms. So you have three separate studies. They didn't see, like they saw, different, different set of same set of doctors, set of doctors, but they jumbled the image. They tried to make sure that it's, they, didn't, they couldn't detect what they had done before. <laughs> so this study was published in uh, Journal of Ophthalmology. Yeah. Oh, we have ground truth. Ah, OK. So these 2,000 images had gone through adjudication. So which means there was another set of doctors who were put in a room and asked to uh, to agree on what the prediction should be, consensus. So for every image, we had consensus ground truth. So it's agreement with that. Right or wrong is with respect to that. How much time? Do you have? Okay. Uh, I can talk about this text model. Or I can talk about this other work. Let me skip the text model. If people are interested in text, we can go through text too. Uh, it's the same story. You find lots of bugs in, in models using attribution. And then you can, in this case, we were able to exploit those attacks by constructing adversarial examples that would fool the network. Let me go through this one, and then I'll talk about this new work that we can do. Uh, 
yeah one thing i want to say is attributions are as a technique are pretty shallow it's still in that first order taylor approximation space they don't tell you sort of how the features are com- getting combined to make up the prediction it's a very first order view of the network they don't tell you which training data mattered whether the model can converge to a, a, a good optima or not an example where attributions are completely useless is the following so suppose you have a task where you want to predict uh, whether the number of black pixels is even or odd here if you do attributions it will fall on all the black pixels so it's a terrible tool at understanding this kind of a network in general attributions are useful when the network behavior entails that a strict subset of input features are important so like in those diagnosis tasks that i talked about in general you know most of the image is unimportant is these micro aneurysms or small lesions that are important and they tell you whether it's it's not that the network does an aggregate computation on all the pixels or the other two key pieces are humans must interpret attributions so attributions by themselves are still numbers the fact that they point out pathologies is still up to the human so the hum- the human plays a key role just like in most debugging the human is a key piece in any debugging tool uh and then the second point is visualization matters so if you screw up the visualization then you are not faithfully representing the attributions we have some work on what is good visualization uh for attribution but i'll skip that we can talk, i can tell you more at the end of the talk ha huh, so this one is this is how the attributions look so there are 50000 pixels some attrib- some pixels have a very large attribution and then there is the long tail now when we are visualizing we make these pic- this point is called 256 but if this is called 256 then this will be something like 40 40 and below is not visible to the human eye it's still it's all black you see this image now there are a bunch of points here that are actually green but we can't see it now if i instead clip this to the 99th percentile then look then i see a lot more pixels so this kind of this all i'm saying is you have to be careful when visualizing that you're not hiding information okay so a different line of work uh, that i've recently been doing Uh, with Corina Pasarenu at at uh, CMU and she was also at NASA Ames and her group uh, so this is about preconditions for uh, neural networks so this is probably a better better fit for the hybrid systems community uh, so so what's a precondition so precondition is a predicate in the input space that implies a certain output property and it's very common in program analysis so if you have this program over here it simply returns x plus x1 plus x2 comma x2 then you say that you know the, the first output is bigger than the second output if x2 is greater than 0 did i mess this up no x1 is greater than 0 right so that's a precondition for that output property in general phi is a precondition if for all x phi of x implies p of f of x then it's a precondition for p can be identified preconditions for properties of deep networks uh and one property that is of interest is that the highest scoring class is k so in that image net we want to find a precondition for firebolt what is the predicate in input space that guarantees that the prediction will be firebolt why is this useful so no, notice that there can be many preconditions for the same output property there can be several phi one if you enumerate all of them then you have a decomposition of that property in the form of these precondition predicates so in a sense you are decomposing the label and saying fireboatness comes from either property either either phi1 being true or phi2 being true or phi3 being true so you can sort of visualize the whole network as a switch statement is these cases and if you have this case then you have that this case then you have that all thing you could do is if you have a misclassified input you can see which case is it hitting maybe that case has more bugs maybe i explore more inputs that hit that case then i can find more misclassified inputs 
A different application of this is you can use these preconditions as interpolants in doing proof. So often you want to prove these contracts that if A appears, if A is true for the input, then B is true for the output. This proof, if done through the whole network, is typically typically computationally expensive. But maybe we can break it down into two simple proofs that I prove that A implies phi and phi implies B. A different application of preconditions is in distilling the network. So when you have large networks, inference cost is very important. So you want you want these object detection networks to be on your phone and tiny devices. So you want inference to work very fast. Suppose I have a precondition for a label, then I can use it as a distillation rule. That is, if I have a new input, I just check if the precondition holds. Hopefully that's quick. Then I directly return the prediction without running the network. So it acts like a cache for predictions. Okay. Now, how do you identify preconditions? Uh, well, first, the set of all training inputs that satisfies that property is also a precondition. But that's an uninteresting one. <laughs> we want these predicates to be, you know, somewhat mathematically concise and mathematically friendly. Uh, we should have high support. Like a lot of real inputs hit it. So, in terms of the, if you take the pro the the input distribution, then the predicate should have high high probability mass. And then the last one is they should somehow be based on the decision logic of the network. In a sense, you want to organize these preconditions based on how the network reasons internally. Our idea in this work is very simple. We base preconditions on the decision patterns of neurons in the network. And we only work with feedforward ReLU networks. So ReLU is the non-linearity applied by every neuron. The ReLU function is simply max of x comma 0. So if the input is greater than 0, it behaves like a line. Otherwise, it's 0. What's a decision pattern? Decision pattern is simply a constraint stating that some neurons are on or some are off. It just says a pattern could say that neuron N3 must be on and N5 must be off. All inputs that have this property in their execution are, are considered to satisfy the pattern. So each pattern sigma defines a predicate sigma x. You could think of N3 as a function of the input. So then this amounts to saying N3x greater than 0 and N5x is equal to 0. That's the case where the ReLU is off. Now still, N3 and N5 are as complicated as the whole function. So this predicate isn't any better to think about. Uh, now, given that these feedforward networks are piecewise linear, you can prove this theorem that for patterns that constrain a set of neurons that is prefix closed, which means if you're constraining N3 and N5, you want to constrain all of these neurons too the ones that feed into it. It could be on or off, whatever assignment you want. Every such pattern which is prefix closed, the predicate sigma of x is convex. In fact, it's a polytope. It's bounded by hyperplanes. It, this is not a complicated theorem. Maybe I should call it a proposition. Uh, it just follows from the piecewise linearity. Now, this... Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Which is key to getting that. Yeah. Uh, so then we we try we we aim for two kinds of preconditions. So input preconditions, which are these prefix closed patterns. Now, how do you find a prefix closed pattern? The simple procedure. So you take an input that you know does satisfy the property. You look at its activation pattern across the entire network. So which neurons were on, which were off. Now this is a decision pattern. You can say this is a predicate that captures all inputs that follows the same activation pattern as this input. So in programming language terms, this is the predicate that says all inputs that follow the same program path as this input. So first step is to find such an input. Second step, you take its activation signature, sigma x, and see if sigma x is already an invariant. If not, you keep searching. Once you've found a sigma x that is an invariant, then you want to sort of weaken it. So you start unconstraining neurons. I say, I, I can take the top layer and make it don't care. Doesn't have to be on or off. 
then see if it still remains an invariant. Now, how do you check that? So there is this theorem prover called ReluPlex. Uh, it's by uh, folks at Stanford, uh, Clark Barrett, uh, David Dill. So it's a theorem prover that can prove properties of uh, ReLU that can prove with ReLU constraints. So it's a, the ReLUplex name comes from Simplex. So Simplex is just linear constraints. And if you throw in ReLU, they can prove, this, they have decision procedure to check ReLU constraints. A second kind of invariant that we come up with is, is invariants that are convex, not in the input space, but in the activation space of a layer. So what we want to do is find decision patterns in a single layer. So can you give me a constraint in a single layer that implies this property? Hopefully this will capture more semantic patterns. See the problem with input preconditions is the predicate that will that you will get will be a small region around the input you began with. It's very syntactic. Here you want to capture like a semantic property. So for this one, we try to learn these predicates from data. So suppose you have a bunch of unlabeled inputs, you run them through the network and you note the activation pattern of, a, of the layer you're interested in. So let's say there's some layer that has only two neurons. There are five inputs, and in one case it was on, off, and the property was true. Other one it was on and on, the property was true, and so on. Then you train a decision tree on this. Each path in this decision tree that goes to a true leaf is, an, is a candidate pattern. You can send them to ReluPlex to check them, or if the theorem if the, if the formal check is expensive, then you can do empirical validation. So you take a held out test set and see how often does that pattern imply the property. Or rather, what is the conditional probability of the, pat of the property being true given that the pattern holds? So here's an example of debugging misclassifications. So what we did is, this is an image that is ground truth 1, but is classified as a 2. We found the input in way, input precondition that this one belongs to. Now that is a convex set. So you can find an under approximation box. So although it's convex, it's still hard to visualize because it's lots of constraints. So easier thing to visualize is an under approximation box or a hypercube that fits inside it. This is the min point of that box and the max point. Oh sorry, a max and min. So this sort of sheds some light on why is this classified as a 2. You can see that it's these pixels, you know, this stuff that's important. So stuff that is stuff that is blue in both, that means it has a very small range. That's very important to be in this constraint. Stuff that is black here and blue over here, it has a lot wider range. So it has more wiggle room, so it's less important. Does that make sense? Here's our distillation example. So again, a toy network, we use an eight layer convolutional network. We trained a decision tree after at the third layer to identify candidate invariants at that layer. Now you can score these invariants based on, by empirically validating them. So how accurate are they at predicting the property? on a held out set. Then you start diverting traffic to those invariants, starting with the highest scoring ones, which means, suppose I want the prediction on this input, I run it to the third layer, then I see if the invariant holds, if, if it holds, then I return the prediction. Otherwise, I'll let it go. Now, depending on where I do draw the cutoff for this, you can get a plot. So this threshold tau is the cutoff, this is the accuracy, this is the latency. If I send nothing, that way I get 99.9943 accuracy and then this is the latency. Now, if I just go a little bit, then I can get a 20% speed up in inference while degrading accuracy only from 0.9943 to 0.9903. There are some other uh, results that we have. So one is we can efficiently prove some properties of ACAS Zoo, which is this uh, flight simulator, uh, flight collision detection network uh, 
where earlier they tried to prove certain properties, certain contracts directly using Deluplex and it used to time out. Now you can identify an invariant at an intermediate layer and then break the proof and it goes through. A few other results. I guess I should stop. All right. So that's the final thing.